I, I got a weird itch to start today's episode because I can't quit these four players in 2024 and you got four that you can't quit either no matter how hard we try we cannot get over drafting these eight players in fantasy football this year welcome man lucas wenzel tyler plath hanging out with you on today's episode no matter how many drafts we do ty no matter how many times this player is put in front of us we have the chance to move past them we just can't So give the people a sneak peek into one player that you're going to be talking about today. Uh, As we were kind of discussing and talking through the guys that we were going to talk about today, I I phrased one of my players as uh, the Drake London of 2024 for me in terms of player takes. And uh, if you if you followed since then, you know how much Drake London just burned me last year. And uh, I I guess I'm opening myself back up to the possibility of that happening again because of this one player that I just cannot quit. That's all the sneak preview you need. Uh, (laughs) Let's dive on in and start talking about these can't quit players. So we're going to break down four players from each of us, players that we have been in on in the past and have disappointed in previous years. Maybe it's somebody who... Uh, let us down um, rather soul crushingly last year, but eight players that no matter where they're at on the board, no matter how many reasons they give us to stop drafting them, we just can't help but keep drafting them. And we're going to make the case as to why we keep drafting them. So Ty, I'll let you start. Uh, This is not the player you prefaced in the intro, but I'm very curious to see what you have to say about this first player. So this guy has really been like a staple of the podcast ever since like we first started it, right? Yes. We have been going out of our way to debunk all the myths, all the lies about this guy. Okay, it's it's time to put some respect back onto Keenan Allen's name, okay? Uh, I get it's a rookie quarterback. I get it's Shane Waldron. I get it's Chicago, and they've never had a 4,000-yard passer, but... What if I told you I don't care? <laughs> it's Keenan Allen. Seriously. He's probably one of my favorite wide receivers in the league because I'm a huge fan of the route runners and the technicians when it comes to the position. And Keenan Allen has been doing it for such a long time that I just can't quit Keenan Allen. Name me a rookie quarterback that has had this good of a wide receiver room in his rookie season. Okay. There's the whole, the, you know, we can look at data. We can look at Brock Purdy. Sorry. <laughs> well, well, I mean, if you're <laughs> if we're counting the first five games of his career, well, well, sure, I, I guess. Did, but I did. <laughs> um, like again, there's data that says that like wide receivers with rookie quarterbacks do not, you know, do not come through at. at in the way that you want them to just based on where they go in drafts and all those kind of things, just because it takes time for rookie quarterbacks to adapt. But look, this is not just any ordinary rookie quarterback. This is Caleb Williams. This is a guy that if you were to take a look at the last 10 years of quarterbacks that have come through the draft, Caleb Williams is one of the top three quarterback prospects to come through the draft. Like this is not just an ordinary quarterback. So even if this offense isn't exactly fireworks, right? That isn't a super high scoring offense or anything like that. I, 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 I just don't want, I, I will not accept any disrespect when it comes to Keenan Allen, who has been so good for so long. And yes, he's got DJ Moore now. And yes, there's other mouths to feed, but Keenan Allen will get on the field. will stay on the field because he is just that good. And, we're not reaching on him when it comes to drafts or anything like that, but I can already see the narrative of, well, he's going to be the slot guy and 32 years old. I can see that narrative now. And I'm just, I'm going to get out ahead of it and just say, stop. This guy gets moved all around the formation, all around the line of scrimmage. He's not just a slot, a slot exclusive guy. So I Keenan Allen can't quit. He's going later than he's gone in drafts. I, I, I'm pretty much taking him every chance that I get because he's just so good at the football. So good at the football. So I look, I'm, 
I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm okay quitting Keenan Allen this year, personally. Normally, then I would get be off with the you. podcast. This is a pro Keenan Allen show. <laughs> I look. It's not that I don't. It's not that I don't mind Keenan Allen. I like. I'm just okay skipping him this year because one, I'm not a fan of Shane Waldron. Two, Ron Stewart put out an interesting tweet a few days back. And I think it's easy to just associate rookie with rookie in this Bears offense and associate JSN from last year and the rather frustration Shane Waldron put all JSN managers through last year. And now with these massive question marks of is JSN actually as good as we thought he was, Shane Waldron would have put him on the field and look at Rome and say the same thing this year now of, well, he put the rookie on the field. Does he need to quote unquote prove himself like Shane Waldron said about JSN last year? But Ron Stewart points out like Keenan Allen is going to be the guy who's in the slot. He's going to be the odd man out in two wide receiver sets. When Shane Waldron is running 13 man personnel, like I get a little bit concerned about, about Keenan Allen. And you look at Caleb Williams, as much as I think he's a slam dunk in a situation that's really hard to screw up kind of prospect. There's part of me that's like, you know what? DJ Moore's the one you got to get Rome in there somehow. Deandre Swift has got it. You know, he's going to catch some passes out of the backfield. I like, I I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. Quitting Keenan Allen this year. I, I'm okay with it. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm out on Keenan Allen, I'm just saying when I'm looking at him as the wide receiver 36 and underdog drafts and I have him ranked as my wide receiver 38, like I I don't think he's a smash pick there for me. But I'm okay, I'm okay passing on him. You gave me a look. He's also not going as a wide receiver 36 and underdog. That's Roma Dunze. Uh Keenan Allen is currently, I can pull up his accurate ADP. But I have I have Keenan Allen as my wide receiver 38. I am just like, I'm not super optimistic. I don't think he sees the same you know, high volume targets that he has in past years, six touchdowns. I might need to adjust those targets a bit. I just think DJ Moore is still the lead target getter here. Wow. You you okay. look dumbfounded. Wide receiver 38 is not unplayable, but he's not a top three. He's not a wide receiver three in your rankings. He's not a flex play in your rankings. Looking to find where's Keenan Allen? Watch for 32 on underdog right now. I was close. I was in the ballpark. Ballpark. But like I think well, at I'm, that I'm first... within six wide receivers. And frankly, again, if I give Keenan Allen like five, six, if I but put him up to 125 targets, I'm still in the same range. Like I d I don't he's not going to be the hyper targeted guy in Chicago with a quarterback that's you know as developed as justin herbert caleb williams is great ultra talented but like let's not act like let's not I, I, I as much as i think he's a slam dunk prospect i don't think we can just walk in and, and expect the best chicago bears quarterback they've ever had in year one like can caleb williams throw less than four thousand yards in year one yes or no yes which is like, I just don't think it's a slam dunk that he automatically throws for, you know, 4,200 yards in year one and has a CJ Stroud kind of season. I just don't think we can just expect that and guarantee that despite all the weapons that they have, despite how good of a prospect he is. That's all. That's all. I'm like Keenan Allen. Like if you take him as your wide receiver three, I'm perfectly okay with that. I have nothing. I, I have no gripes with that. I'm just more out on the Chicago Bears offense than the public is. That's what I keep coming back to. Go ahead. You can kick me off the podcast. You can <laughs> you can expel me. It's fine. What are, what are we supposed to do with our fearless and courageous host? What are we supposed to do? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I almost made a camera joke there, but camera does a great oh. job skipping it for me. <laughs> if only he were here more often. Um. Anyways. Oh. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. There it is. There it is. Um. First player. I can't quit. I hate it. Quote tweeted. Not quote tweeted. Reply to friend of the show Jagger May's tweet the other day saying, "Me and Jahan Dotson are fatally intertwined. 
There is no way you can separate us. After I pushed all my chips in on that man last year, and he went out and just tore my heart into 25 pieces. I mean, there was nobody more excited for Jahan Dotson than I was last year because in year one, he looked like a legit threat in the NFL. He went all over the field. They pushed him downfield. He went over the middle of the field, scored seven touchdowns his rookie season. I mean, things were looking up for Jahan Dotson, but last year, this dude was first team all cardio. I mean, he ran the fourth most routes in the league, but my gosh, he turned in a putrid year. 83 targets, which was 49th. Only 518 yards was 65th. He only ran 0.83 yards per route, which was 92nd in the league, Tyler. And that led to only 0.2 fantasy points per route, which was 89th. I mean, it was terrible. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't have looked more stupid about Jahan Dotson. I have every reason to say, no, nah, Jahan Dotson, you suck, bro. Like, I, 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 I'm not going to give you the ammunition again this year to hurt me. But I refuse to believe the Jahan Dotson we saw last year is representative of the actual NFL player that Jahan Dotson is. Because even you look at his reception perception chart last year, of the 11 routes that Matt Harmon tracks, Dotson ran a success rate at 70% or higher on nine of them. Nine of 11, Jahan Dotson had a success rate of at least 70%. And we have to remember this offense last year was run by Eric Bieniemy, who had been passed over how many times for head coaching opportunities, had to forcefully leave Kansas City because he was sitting under the shadow of Andy Reid and couldn't get it done. Now it makes sense why he was looked over for so many NFL head coaching jobs, because he could not run a competent offense in the NFL last year. So now this year, Oh, let's not forget. I, I, I can't. I can't believe I forgot. So you got Sam Howell at quarterback too last year. Like, <laughs> like let's not pretend that Sam Howell is a, is a completely competent NFL quarterback. So now you get Heisman winner Jaden Daniels coming in at the quarterback position. You get Cliff Kingsbury, who go ahead, clown him all you want, but help Kyler his rookie season support Christian Kirk as a top forty fantasy wide receiver. You have Curtis Samuel who's out of town. The only competition that Jahan Dotson really has is. You know, Terry McLaurin, who is obviously the wide receiver one there, but you know, old man Zach Ertz, let's just call him what he is, an old man. You got rookie Ben Senna, but you and I don't believe in rookie tight ends. You got Diami Brown. Ooh, scary Diami Brown. And you know, rookie wide receiver Luke McCaffrey, who at best would be a threat in the second half of the season, but I still think Jahan Dotson is the much better NFL wide receiver than Luke McCaffrey will be. So all of this to say, there is plenty of optimism still for Jahan Dotson. And when I'm looking at him at the wide receiver 60, man, I'm ready to get hurt all over again. I'm I'm still so in on Jahan Dotson this year. And I have like dynasty leagues. I am trading you know, bare minimum for him because I think a lot of dynasty managers are ready to be done with him redraft leagues this year you know what he's probably gonna be you know a wide receiver four or five on a lot of my fantasy teams if i just punt wide receiver you know you know if i get my top three wide receivers and punt wide receiver for a while like i got plenty of optimism still for Jahan dotson and i'm not giving up on him i am ready to get hurt again this year i think the beauty of dotson is that he is going this late in drafts that you're not investing you know, major capital in the guy versus last year. I think there was a bit of optimism that he could, you know, have this, have the sophomore leap and all those kind of things, especially again, with the name like Eric B enemy, who is going to be the, the play caller. But I, I will say this too, like Jahan Dotson, I'm expecting him to play a little more in the slot than in years past. He's played more out wide. I'm expecting him to be in the slot a little bit more. And that's not, I mean, there is two ways to kind of look at the slot position when it comes to football, right? You'd see the guys in the slot that are very low a dot that are really yards after the catch guys, or you see them as deep threats that only come on the field in three wide receiver sets. And they don't make the field as often in two wide receiver sets. Dotson is quite literally like the happy medium 
that he can win in the short areas, but he can also win deep and he can play in these two wide receiver sets. So it's not like he's going to be like off the field for a majority of the time. Maybe even last year, again, the fourth most routes run of any wide receiver, right? Like right. I, I honestly kind of want to plug him like underdog, like cardio club, because it's like, dude, like you're <laughs> like a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> like a thousand can we miles please? ahead of them. <laughs> oh, can we please? If our friend, our friends over at Underdog, if you're listening, to, can we please? Can we please get a cardio club? Or can we? Uh, how do I want to say? It? Can we just like specially nominate NFL athletes? <laughs> just stupid. Alec Pierce, perfect example. Pierce. John Dotson, per- just free entry into the cardio club. They don't even got to draft teams. I mean, they can't. No. They're NFL players. But can we just get them like? For free admission Seriously. into the cardio club <laughs> again we need to we need to make their year like worth something right <laughs> but <laughs> again like the fact that he's going this late in drafts and we we literally just did a mock draft i don't know last week two weeks ago and i got jahan dotson cam got jahan dotson i don't even remember how the teams played out no cam did in the 11th round at the end of the 11th round like yeah. He is you're not investing a lot in the guy he with a very with, his situation is just 10 times better than what it was last year. Like there is really no reason to not take the flyer on Jahan Dotson when you get into those later rounds in your drafts. Let's move on to another wide receiver tie. And now we're going to get back to your tease at the top of the episode. I can't believe you threw out. I I guess I can kind of believe you threw out the the Drake London comparison in terms of how you felt about him last year to this player. I guess I just didn't fully realize how in and excited you were for this player, which makes all the more sense in the world why you're so stoked to have gotten him in a dynasty trade recently. Well, I mean, (laughs) when you look at what I paid to get the guy, I mean, like it adds even more to it. But look, T Higgins, K. I, I, we were all in on T Higgins last year and I, every single person that drafted him, every single person that, you you know, selected him in DFS or ever, he burned everybody. Now it wasn't all like his fault because he dealt with some injuries and then he had, he didn't have Joe Burrow for the second half of the season, all those different things. But here's the, I was I was talking about T Higgins earlier in the video that we actually posted yesterday. You should check that out. The question that we've been asking about T Higgins for the past two seasons is can he take the next step? Can he take a step forward and command more targets in the Cincinnati offense? For the past two years, <clears throat> uh, I would say that he has not taken that step forward. And because of that, he hasn't commanded more targets. But what if I told you that this year, we don't need to ask that question anymore. That question is answered because there are just vacated available targets that are ready to go around in this Cincinnati offense. Okay. No more Tyler Boyd, no more Joe Mixon, no more Irv Smith and his 28 targets, but still he's not on the team. And I doubt that Tanner Hudson their What is ESPN has him as their third string tight end on their depth chart. I doubt that he sees 50 targets again. I doubt that he's going to be the number five target getter in this offense. So that's 190 vacated targets, I believe, between Boyd, Mixon, and Smith. Let's take 20 of 50 of Hudson's targets from last year. We're at 210 vacated targets. All that they did this offseason. Yes, Jermaine Burton, very, very talented prospect in the third round. He's not going to see 90 targets this year. So we give him 80 we're left at 130, okay? Now you've got Mike Gusecki. Tight ends have never played a role in the Cincinnati offense. We can give him 50, okay? There's 80 targets then between Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and the running backs. I don't think Chase Brown is going to be super involved. I think he's just a change of pace kind of running back. Zach Moss, yes, we like Zach Moss out of value this year, but the fact is he signed a two-year deal for a total of $8 million, but just $3 million guaranteed. So they do not have a lot invested in this running game that if it weren't to, if the, if it's not going to pan out, they can pivot off of him after this year. But for this year, you've got Jamar chase and you've got T Higgins. And you've got Joe Burrow. You can, you can win games with that kind of trio. Okay. 
I again, I don't think the question that we have to ask is can he take the step forward to command more targets? I just think that he will command more targets because there is more targets available to him that he doesn't need to take a step forward in that sense. The path is just so much clearer this year. You know, I think it's Fancy Pros's uh expert consensus rankings right now. Higgins is the wide receiver 29. Yeah. That I like that. that one's low. I may be a little too high based on my rankings right now. He's my wide receiver 16, maybe a little high. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> maybe a little whoa. high. But again, I the question again is answered in that we don't need him to take a step forward. He will see more targets because there is no Tyler Boyd. There is no more Joe Mixon in this Cincinnati offense. So every time that I can get a T Higgins in best ball in dynasty in redrafts this year and what will be the upcoming drafts, I should say, because we haven't done any redraft drafts yet. I'm going to be targeting T Higgins in that like fourth round, fifth round, because that's where he's going to be going this year. I disagree that Jermaine Burton only sees 85 targets this year. I what you got 90. him down for 88? <laughs> I got him for 91. <laughs> oh, geez. Wow. <laughs> difference maker. <laughs> Big difference maker. Are you kidding me? No. Uh, I mean, and Jermaine Burton will have a lot of growing to do in this offense as well, which almost lends to, you know, the Jamar Chase and T. Higgins argument even more, right? Um, and I throw in Jamar Chase just because, you know, he's still going in that top five range. And my guess is that he sees, you know, a few of those targets fall his way too, but. I mean, I do agree. If T Higgins stays on the football field, like this man could easily finish as a top 20 wide receiver this year. I think there's no question about that. Like, I'm looking at my projections for T Higgins. I think I'm a little low. I might need to do some redistributing of targets on that Bengals team. Um, Cause I, like you said, you know, ECR says wide receiver 29 on him. I, he's my wide receiver 28, but like, yeah, I only have him for 121 targets, 77 receptions, uh, just shy of 1,100 yards and seven touchdowns. But you know, if I get, let's say I I bump him up, you know, to 130 targets, you know, his catch percent, you know, he'll he'll add a few more receptions, probably up to like 82 targets, you know, up five fantasy points. You know, then we're looking at him as a top 20 guy for me. So, I like that's all it takes is I'm like a touchdown or four receptions away from him, basically cracking my top 20, uh, yep. which. I think is highly likely. And again, once I just redistribute those stats, like I think you'll see T Higgins be way ahead of ECR for me. And despite the injury like concerns, I'm expecting such a bounce back here for those Bengals offense. It cannot be as bad as it was last year. And if T Higgins stays on the field, yeah, I think he he's a legit threat to be a top 20 guy. Yeah. I mean, your redistribution of targets in the Cincinnati offense and that like, stat projection that's where i'm at with him i've got him 82 catches 130 targets 1100 yards six touchdowns right he's my wide receiver 16 that's all that it takes Ty, let's take a quick break uh we'll be back with the other five players that we just can't seem to quit this year Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLAS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. All righty, now we'll get back in three, two, one. All righty, we are back. Man, you're getting so much better at that. You're like timing it to a T now. Well, That's the thing is, it, it, if, if you... I was uh, watching on YouTube. The audio podcast has no clue what Ty's doing. I'm just like, wow, <laughs> you're timing that really good. And like, what is Ty doing? What, <laughs> what is, is he doing actually he's doing? Timing? No, the the secret is always be early because you look way you look smarter than trying to be. You know, if you're late on it, sorry, Cam, you're always late, but it's okay. 
Cam sucks at guessing games. I actually don't know if that's true, but <laughs> gosh, I can't believe he doesn't throw more jabs at me when I'm gone. Like I'm waiting for the one episode where like it's titled one thing on YouTube, but it's really just like a roast of lucas it's like <laughs> you just like you put up the three person the three person <laughs> prompter still and you just got a screen share of my face and it's just me smiling but it's just you guys roasting me the whole time oh we'll uh, bring we'll bring in tyler we'll we'll bring in kluge we'll bring in jagger we'll bring in really every everyone that we that we've connected with that uh actually like enjoys your tweets and your content and stuff and we'll just say name one bad thing about lucas and uh we can just turn oh, they, they probably dislike more about me than they like about me let's be let's be perfectly honest no uh let's keep moving with players that we can't quit in 2024 uh so far we've talked about keenan allen Jahan dots and t higgins three wide receivers i guess we're talking about wide receivers early and often because i can't quit chris olave man gave me every reason in the world to quit him last year i had him as a top 10 guy last year and, you know, you look at where Olave finished. He finished as the wide receiver 16 in PPR formats last year. But my gosh, it didn't feel like it as a Chris Olave manager myself. So the wide receiver 20 in fantasy points per game. He only scored five times. And his yards per out run last year, they dipped from 2.5, which was the 10th most in the league his rookie season, to 2.08 last year, which was 21st. You know, which isn't a terrible metric, but... Yeah, I would have loved to still see him be a you know a top 10, top 12 guy in yards per out run this year. But I think as much as we can like downplay the reality of Chris Olave last year and how disappointing it was after you know we we hyped him up so much, is that he was still utilized down the field as the alpha in this offense, right? He had 1,834 air yards. That was the sixth most in the league. He has 32nd, or not 32nd in deep targets, excuse me. He had 32 deep targets, which was fourth most. He had 1,058 unrealized air yards. And let me translate for you, missed opportunity. That's what unrealized air yards are. There was 1,000 missed yards of missed, 1,000 yards of missed opportunity there. That was the third most in the league last year. Now, I'm not saying he converts on all 1,000 of those yards, and no wide receiver is going to. Every wide receiver is going to have missed opportunity, right? But that is a significantly high number in comparison to the total amount of air yards Chris Olave saw last year. And I don't think any of this is going to change because this is, what, this is who Chris Olave is. This is what we knew him as as a prospect, and this is what he's going to continue to be in this offense, even with, Cl even with um, Clint Kubiak, excuse me, coming over from the New Orleans Saints, if he even gets two, three touchdowns to fall his way, and he puts up a very, very similar stat line to last year, you know, we're easily looking at this guy as a top 12 wide receiver, and instead of the wide receiver 16, you just don't feel that great about. Him. So for me, I just still have an immense amount of optimism for Chris Olave, despite being in on him last year, despite loving him as the next breakout star, I still think that's really in the cards for him this year. And while everyone is is talking about him, I don't know if I want to take him that early in the second round, right? You're looking at the Brandon Ayuk, Devontae Adams, Chris Olave kind of range. Like at the end of the day, you know, my pecking order, I do have Devontae Adams ranked the highest, but I have zero problem taking Chris Olave there because I do think he still has that, you know, he's not a sleeper, but like that post hype breakout potential this year. You know, if he gets just two, three more touchdowns to fall his way, I still think we see his target share go up. I mean, he went from 119 in 15 games last year to 138 in 16 games. You know, he plays a full 17 season. I don't see why he can't be a 150 plus target guy this next year. I feel like the question is just going to come down to touchdowns. It's like him and Michael Pittman, I see very, very similarly, even though like, I have more faith in Olave kind of coming through in terms of ADP and stuff, just because I know that he's utilized downfield versus Michael Pittman. Like he only had 13 D targets last year. Like he's just not used downfield and that's fine. Um, but at least with Olave, like you get big play opportunity, right? And that's what set, that's what separates Olave from Pittman for me. But both of these guys are going to have touchdown question marks going into next year, right? How often are, are, you know, is this saints offense going to score, right? Colts, is it going to be Michael Pittman that's going to be the, the red zone option? Is it going to be A.D. Mitchell? You know, you've got Anthony Richardson, you've got Jonathan Taylor, but at least for Olave, like the touchdowns, if they come through, if we see six, seven, eight touchdowns, he's going to be a top eight, top nine guy, right? 
because you know the volume is going to be there. You know that the yards are going to be there too because, again, he's used short, medium, and long. Like he, he, he is kind of everything you want in a, you know, from a volume perspective. It's just, can we get two touchdowns? And I, I, I think there is reason to believe that he can just because with this Clint Kubiak hire coming over from San Francisco, there it's going to be a little more pass friendly than having a Sean Payton disciple as uh, oh. as the play caller. I mean, here's the thing. Like, how many touchdowns has Taysom Hill just scarfed from this offense? Uh, too many. Too many to count. I doubt that we're going to see Taysom Hill be used and utilized the same way that he has the past two years. That's so many touchdowns just opened up then for whoever in this offense. I mean, that that, and I think you're totally fair questioning the touchdowns, which is I think what I think everybody else is questioning. I feel like a lot of people don't entirely know. It's like, oh, Chris Olave got Derek Carr's a quarterback. What a bomb. And it's like, okay, but like you look at his stats. I mean, the guy's going for 1100 yards. He's hovering right around 13 yards of reception. Like these are good things. His yards per route run were up his rookie season. We know this is a hyper talented guy. Dude just needs to find the end zone. And I think we'll see those uh, touchdown numbers continue to trend upward because it's him and I love Rashid Shaheed. You and I both know I love I love our boy Rashid Shaheed, but you know, he ain't no Chris Olave. Jawan Johnson, my gosh, I, nowhere near the talent. Chris Olave. You know, it's Chris Olave, Alvin Kamara, and the rest of the cast, basically. So I think you're going to see these touchdown numbers tick up for Chris Olave. I just don't think he can sit around four or five for his entire career with the caliber of player that he is. Let's talk about one last wide receiver tie. One player that you can't quit. I honestly don't blame you for not being able to quit this player, despite all the hype coming out about um, really his other two teammates. But I think there should still be plenty of optimism here for this player. Tyler Lockett um, is just going too late in drafts, in my opinion. I get that he's 31. He's going he's going to turn 32 in season. So I get that people can predict the fall off because we are at that 31 32 year age where wide receivers just start to decline a bit. Yes, I've talked about JSN in the past. I've talked about DK like I've talked about those guys in very, very positive lights. But I think Tyler Lockett just kind of flies under the radar because no one really everyone just sees two wide receivers thriving in this offense. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that like all three are going to finish with like 110 targets and like 70 receptions, but like Tyler Lockett is still a very, very talented wide receiver. Again, 31 years old. He was still the wide receiver 32 last year. He had his fifth straight season with at least 73 receptions and he was top 12 in total route wins. According to player profiler. Yes. JSN is going into year two. I do expect JSN to overtake Tyler Lockett at some point this year and be that wide receiver too. I, I'll, I'll just say like by season's end, we'll see that happen. But I don't think that means that Tyler Lockett's going to fade away or fall off or anything like that. I think he's still going to be very, very involved, you know, first half of the season at least. And then we may see the things start to change, but for where Tyler Lockett goes in drafts right now, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me just because, again, this will be a pass-friendly offense in Seattle. All three of these wide receivers are very, very talented. Tyler Lockett is just flying under the radar, and I see why, but I, I think people need to understand that he's kind of a value right now in at least best ball drafts, and I think redraft drafts as well if you're doing mock drafts. Yeah, I mean, and this is just going to be a pass half a offense with Ryan Grubb, right? I think there's room for all three of these wide receivers to eat. I think you're going to see a lot more three wide receiver, one tight end personnel in this offense, which I think gives plenty of room for the likes of DK Metcalf, the likes of JSN, the likes of Tyler Lockett to, to really thrive in this offense. And if, if nothing else, Tyler Lockett has given you consistency uh, and dependability. Right. I mean, this is a guy where every year people just want to keep writing him off. want to keep saying, ah, yeah, you know what? This might be the year, though, because DK Metcalf is there and he's going to assert himself as the alpha. Correct me if I'm wrong. Tyler Lockett had more targets than DK Metcalf last year. I think he did. Uh, I want to say I know he didn't have more receiving yards. Um, 
I'm pulling up their stats right now. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm pulling up their stats, and I can't type and talk at the same time. But I do believe Tyler Lockett had more targets than DK Metcalf last year, and I know you got the emergence of JSN. I think DK Metcalf is still the, the number one lead guy there. But to just assume that Tyler Lockett is going to fall off the face of the earth this year and not, you know, get back at his current or give back at his current ADP, I find that very, very hard to believe. And I think there's quite literally zero reason you should be quitting him. And if you are, I think that's a, a very bad mistake. Yeah. So Lockett had 13 more receptions than DK. He had three more targets, but DK was just used way more downfield. So he got more yards and had more touchdowns. But again, like Lockett is last year we were still seeing one a one b and i think this year we'll probably see one two three more so but yeah i I, like we're we're writing off another good player whether it's because of age or young talent behind him like we're we're writing them off and i think we're just jumping the gun a little too early here a smart player at that too like tyler lockett Mm -hmm. doesn't take hits like there are there are slide down compilations of tyler lockett for a reason Like, like this man does not take a hit he stays healthy. So, yeah, I, I'm 100% in on, on Tyler Lockett still. And I, yeah, there's zero reason when he comes up on the board. I'm like, you know what? I'm actually, actually kind of excited to take Tyler Lockett here. I'll say this real quick, too. Like in best ball drafts right now, like this wide receiver, what? I'll start with Corlin Sutton, right? That wide receiver, 49. like 49 to wide receiver 54. We're looking at, I'm pulling it up here. We're looking at, so Cortland Sutton, Curtis Samuel, Tyler Lockett, Romeo Dobbs, Khalil Shakir, Rashid Shahid. I I like like in that range. Not gonna lie. I like all of them, but like give me Cortland Sutton because that's a clear one in Denver, but then give me Tyler Lockett. Honestly, give me Lockett. And then like at that point, like it's probably then between like Shakir Dobbs and Shahid because each of them have some intrigue to them. But like Tyler Lockett's still kind of towards the top of that list for me. Yeah. I mean, he's the most debatably the most proven on that list. I think you could easily say he's the most proven ahead of Cortland Sutton on that list. And mm-hmm. I would, I would stand by you in that take. Let's switch it up. Let's quit talking wide receivers. We talked five of them already. We really should have called this, you know, five wide receivers. We can't you know, quit this year, but I am going to switch it up. I am going to talk about a running back. Can't believe I'm going to freaking make a case about this argue back about this running back. But my gosh, is he going? I'm going to double check his ADP on underdog right now. 37, I, I think it is. Oh my gosh, it's 37. I have him ranked so much higher than 37, dude. I have Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, I believe ranked as my running back 28 right now. 40. Sorry, 40. Oh my gosh, I have him freaking 12 running backs ahead of ADP. Are you serious? Uh, I I can't quit. <laughs> I can't quit Ezekiel Elliott. I I can't. I wanted to last year. I wanted to. And I and I and I almost I almost did. I almost did. And then he re-signed with the Dallas Cowboys. And you can hyper Rico Dowdle up all you want, but I'll take the guy who used to be the pride of this Dallas Cowboys offense. Right. I don't think that I know it's only a one year, two million dollar guaranteed money contract. I get it. Yeah, uh, really only 1.6 in the in the guaranteed money, but it was a you know three hundred and seventy five thousand dollars signing bonus. Totals out to be two two million. We're not going to talk details on that. But Tony Pollard now is gone. He is a member of the Tennessee Titans. Ty, you want to take a guess how many opportunities Tony Pollard got last year? Two hundred and seventy something. He if you if you if you rack up his two hundred and fifty two carries. And 67 targets. We're talking about nearly 320 opportunities that are now available in the running back room for the the Dallas Cowboys. 320. I believe he caught 55 of those 67. So if you really don't want to count the targets and you want to do that instead, fine. Whatever. 305. Go ahead. Be upset with me. Now, I am not going to sit here and tell you that all 320 of those opportunities are going to Ezekiel Elliott. I think that is just stupid, let alone all 320 of those opportunities go to the running back room. Because I do think we're going to see this Dallas Cowboys offense you know, throw a bit more this year, despite how often they threw last year. But you're going to tell me the guy that was second on the New England Patriots in targets last year. That is not a joke. Ezekiel Elliott saw 65 targets last year. That was the second most on the New England Patriots. The guy who was averaging 21 touches per game while Ramondre Stevenson was out. 
won't get at least 230 touches this year, invaluable ones at that around the end zone, ahead of Rico Dowdle, who is not a goal line back, in a Dallas Cowboys offense that's going to be in the red zone in scoring position constantly because of how competent they are? I, why are we taking this guy as a running back 40? I don't think Rico Dowdle closes the gap enough. Like, I, I only have Ezekiel Elliott statted out for 185 rush attempts this year. That being said, I have him statted out for, where is it? 62 targets, less than he had last year. Less than Tony Pollard had last year. I mean, it's just silly to me that we're taking him as the running back 40. He may not have a lot left in the tank efficiency-wise, but my gosh, there are enough running back touches up for grabs in the Dallas Cowboys running back room that I think Ezekiel Elliott just takes advantage of because he's been with this team before. It's not too hard to reintegrate this guy back into the offense when he already knows your system and not much has changed. Running back 40. I can't quit it. I can't. Not when he's ranked you know, 10 to 12 running backs ahead of where he's going right now for me. You just look disgusted. Uh, not at me. Sad. I know that. No, it's just sad boy hours over here. Just... <laughs> Golly, Tony, Tony, Tony Pollard, man. Like, uh, I I told you and Cam this. He was the literally the running back three in expected fantasy points per game because of literally the amount of opportunities he got. Yep. And now we're, now we're, hmm. I literally, and I know you said that Rico Dowdle isn't a power back, but I want you to go tell Dallas Cowboys fans that because that's what I got told all of last year, that Rico Dowdle is the power back, that he's the goal line back. Make it make sense. And you know what? Jerry Jones did make it make sense because he went out and got Zeke. I get that he's old. I get that he's coming from New England. How is Zeke not going to be involved in this offense? How is he not going to be the 1A in this offense? How is he not going to be the one in this offense? Like, come on now. Let, let's. I, I Maybe the upside is not there just because of his age. Sure. Maybe that's why he's going running back 40 in best ball drafts. But he's a volume guy, and he's going late in redraft drafts as well. It, if you want volume, you go get Zeke in the later rounds. It's just that simple. I'm not going to add much more onto that, just because I think we could sit here and debate Zeke and Tony Zeke versus Tony Pollard all we want, but that's not good podcast material. That's just me. Nobody wants to hear a Zeke versus Tony Pollard argument. Yeah, some of but, us learned that the hard way last year. I, jeez. <laughs> But I mean, again, you look at Rico Dowdle, only 89 rush attempts last year to Pollard's 252. Again, you could definitely throw, you know, another 25 rush attempts Dowdle's way if you really want to. Uh, Dowdle only saw 22 targets last year. We saw Ezekiel Elliott can carry a majority of that load in the receiving game anyways for the New England Patriots. Like, I just find it really hard to believe Zeke isn't going to be the, the solidified 1A there. And that he doesn't do it on the back of you know plenty of receiving work as well because he showed he could catch the ball last year and with the Dallas Cowboys too. Let's be honest, it wasn't just a Patriots thing last year. He could he showed he could catch the ball with the with the Cowboys as well. But yeah, I can't quit Ezekiel Elliott, man. This, the value is too good right now. Let's wrap it up, Ty. Uh, mostly because we're getting to the disgusting part of the episode where <laughs> we're actually going to talk about tight ends. And two tight ends that might amount to nothing this year. Can we perf be perfectly honest with ourselves? This is they might amount to vibes. This is this is, this is purely vibes. this is purely vibes. This is also like the heart and soul of this episode. <laughs> like <laughs> Jahan, I kicked it off with Jahan Dotson. I got us off to a hot start, but these are two guys that like deep down is really the the, the driving point of this episode, despite them both being tight ends. Oh man, this guy is literally nicknamed the drug you can't quit in our main dynasty league <laughs> because I can't, I, I can't quit Zach Ertz. I don't get it. I don't know why, but we're literally talking about two commanders in the same can't quit episode. What is wrong with us? We need different. Something jobs. is wrong with us. Help us, please. <laughs> No, literally, uh, look, Zach Ertz, there's not much of an argument other than that, like Zach Ertz and Cliff Kingsbury are just 
are, are a great match for each other, right? 18% target share in 2021 in Arizona with Kingsbury in just 11 games. Then it was 11.1 in 2022 in just 10 games. But that 2022 season was just like beyond like repair, beyond saving. Like that was just a bad season for everybody. So you just take the two seasons and you look at total targets that he got in just 21 games. He had 150 targets. Uh, that's seven per game. Uh, uh, and I think a lot of people will go like, well, he didn't have a Terry McLaurin and a Jahan Dotson and a Russian quarterback in Arizona. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he had Kyler Murray as a quarterback. Uh, he had DeAndre Hopkins. He had Christian Kirk for a year. Like Zach Ertz has always been around competition. Even when he was in Philly, he's always been around competition and he's always come through it. Yes, the injuries stink because, again, we're talking about a 21 game sample in two years. He gets hurt as long as he's healthy. And again, we kicked it off with the fact I don't was at the very beginning. We just don't believe in rookie tight ends. How is Zach Ertz just not going to step right into a very productive role in this Washington offense? Like, I, I can't quit Zach Ertz. It doesn't make sense. He's old man Zach Ertz. Like last year, last year, I think like a guy I couldn't quit was Adam Thielen, right? Like yeah. now I think a lot of people had the expectation of that Carolina offense being better, but like I stuck with Adam Thielen even when things were not good in that Carolina offense. Zach Ertz might just be like the Adam Thielen of 2024 for me. Just old man, barely keeping it together, and he's still going to produce somehow, some way. The other thing about Zach Ertz, too, is I think you're going to look for a safety blanket for this rookie quarterback. I don't think it's necessarily going to be Jahan Dotson or Terry McLaurin. They got rid of Curtis Samuel. You got, again, Diami Brown, who is much more of a deep threat than he is, you know, middle of the field underneath guy. This could be Zach Ertz all day long. Uh, and you can hype up Ben Sennett all you want. Let's not forget Zach Ertz kept Trey McBride off the football field for the entire first year of his career. Trey McBride, who is the better tight end prospect than Ben Sennett, might I remind you. Trey McBride, actually a highly touted tight end prospect coming out of Colorado State. Not as high as, you know, Don Kincaid or Michael Mayer or, you know, any of those other guys. But let's not act like Zach Ertz hasn't kept rookies off the field before. So I think there's all this optimism for Ben Sennett. Yours truly, I think Ben Sennett is a great dynasty piece to have. But in terms of 2024, I think it's still Zach Ertz as long as he's healthy and on the football field with Jane Daniels at quarterback, who's going to look for an underneath blanket safety guy. Like it just screams Zach Ertz. And the fact that he's going, you know, undrafted basically. If you if you like punt on tight end and you don't draft a single one, you're like, whatever, I'll figure it out. I'll stream it every single week. I would just go ahead and draft Zach Ertz with my final pick in the draft to start week one. Because I think he has just as good of a chance of hitting as you know any of the guys basically going after Cole Komet. That's kind of where I draw my line at the tight ends this year. Maybe you can throw in Pat Fryer there if you really want to, but I'm I'm just not in on Pat Fryer this year. So yeah, I love Zach Ertz. I think he keeps Ben Sennett off the field. Yeah, and you look at the target competition, it's Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. Sorry, I don't love Dammy Brown and Luke McCaffrey all that much. I just don't. So I, but, but I do like Zach Ertz this year. I think he has a real, real chance to be a deep, deep undrafted sleeper tight end that you should honestly probably just take a flyer on in the last round of your drafts. What's a rookie quarterback's best friend? It's also a backup quarterback's best friend, but a rookie quarterback's too is the tight end position. Unless if they're a rookie tight end. Just All right. I'll wrap up with my tight end. I I no offense. Um uh, look. Oh god. Yeah, I need to I need to I need to make an announcement. I need to make an announcement. We need we what uh what movie is it with Will Farrell where he's like ladies and gentlemen, I have an urgent announcement. Is what is the example? movie? Is the step is the step brothers? Oh man, it, well, it's which, like a TikTok sound. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember which one it is. Oh, I'm gonna look that up because it's annoying me. But you you make your t- that needs to be a soundbite on this on this podcast. Then, um, 
I have an announcement to make. Uh, it is with deep sadness, regret, and remorse that Mo Ali Cox and I have um, mutually agreed to a divorce from one another. We will no longer be thank I, I appreciate your love and support, Ty. For those of you who you know didn't see that on the audio version, Ty was applauding me. We have mutually agreed to part ways. We think it's better for both of us in the long term that we don't hitch our wagons to each other uh, because Mo Ali Cox brings me deep sadness now. I've he, he has hurt me too many times as my beloved reckless sleeper tight end. And instead of Mo Ali Cox, I am now officially proposing engagement to Noah Fant as my deep sleeper tight end that I absolutely love and will throw endless darts on in my drafts because Noah Fant finally got his own divorce from Shane Waldron in the crappy Seattle situation he found himself in. Let's not forget that Noah Fant was an elite athletic tight end coming out in 2019 that the Denver Broncos took in the first round with the 20th pick. Actually had two decent seasons with the Denver Broncos. But Shane Waldron just continued to keep him in his garbage two tight end system that benefited literally nobody. Now you get Ryan Grubb coming in, who's going to have a much more pass happy offense. Who the Seattle Seahawks now, Noah Fant, went out and signed him to a two year, $21 million deal. That is not pocket change, my friends. So just as the Seattle Seahawks are committed to Noah Fant, I am committed to Noah Fant now as well. I think things are looking up for Noah Fant this year. Tight end 24 on underdog drafts right now. He is, him and Zach Ertz are my two favorite late round sleeper tight ends that I will throw endless darts on this year. So first things first, there's a reason why we don't do a whole lot of pop culture references on this <laughs> podcast because just looking it up and i go oh of course it is it's anchor man i said that <laughs> i told Gosh. you it was anchor man yeah i guess then again i did say i guess i don't know for sure but that was it sounded like for sure an anchor man quote yep and uh we'll get that sound up and going for future use but uh Gosh, that's just not a very uh not not the best way to paint a positive light about your pop culture knowledge and references, but uh considering we're only 25, 26, 27 years old. Man, geez, man, need to watch some more movies. Um which is funny. Heard endgame's on at your place right now. Can go <laughs> Oh shoot, gotta gotta go. Um no, so Noah Fant, I, mm, how do I say this nicely? Uh, I would rather, uh, I, if don't, we're, I don't want to invest a lot in Noah Fant emotionally. Okay, that I accept. I overinvest Be emotionally in, in some of these tight ends, you're right. Because like it just feels like there's always like the late round sleeper tight end that everyone tries to predict. Um, I don't really know the last time that one of those has actually kind of like paid off, at least in like you know what most good tight ends go early in drafts, and that's just kind of the way that it always will be. Um I just don't know what Noah Fant's role in this Seattle offense is. Yes, we know it's going to be more pass friendly, but I don't really know how a tight end kind of fits into this Ryan Grubb offense. That being said, though, the money aspect of this, can't you can't help but think like he's going to have a role because if he doesn't have a role and they paid him all that money, it doesn't make sense. So, um, yeah. Uh, no offense, draft capital is there, kind of like you said. He had good seasons in Denver. Um, I guess I don't mind him as a late round kind of flyer guy. Personally, I you know if it were you know let's say twelfth round, last pick of my draft, and I still haven't taken a tight end, I'm looking at no offense or Zach Ertz. 
I might go Zach Ertz just because I know that he's got the clearest path to targets right away. But I'm definitely going to keep Noah Fant on a watch list because I can't help but like I, I'm not going to like completely rule out a good solid year for Noah Fant where he's tight end 16, tight end 17, maybe a bye week guy for you if you need it. So, uh, you can I how you. How you can quit Keenan Allen, I can quit Noah Fant. Which is fair. Uh, gosh, we're talking about late round tight ends. We need to just <laughs> put this show I think on my route. quitting of Keenan Allen is more significant than yours of Noah Fant. I know. But we need to put this show on ice. Well, okay, yeah. so so here's the last thing I'll say about Noah Fant, though. Um, you know, all, all the all the proposal marriage jokes aside about you know, the, the late round tight ends that I hitch my wagons to. Um, the big thing with the Seattle Seahawks offense last year is that for if their, their entire team existence depended on it, they could not sustain a drive. Mm. I'm just expecting them to be able to do that far better this year. And I think you'll get to see more opportunities for Noah Fant that way. I mean, he scored zero touchdowns last year after scoring at least three in every single year of his career and four straight the two years prior. Like, I think you'll see a bounce back in that regard for Noah Fant. So um, in an offense that I think will be significantly better this year, I'll take a shot on a guy. Yeah, has a loaded wide receiver room, but very clearly, you know, without Colby Parkinson and um, Will Disley, I think will be is very clearly the, the number one tight end there and especially you know, the bag that they gave him as well. So I, as, as much as I love Noah Fant in Denver, I thought you know he'd be a top twelve guy for years to come. I'm you know I'm I'm back in and I can't can't quit Noah Fant. I'm not saying he's gonna be top twelve, but you know if I'm looking <laughs> for a tight end too, if I'm looking for a guy to stream, especially in my best ball drafts, I, I I can't quit Noah Fant. We'll wrap it up there, Ty. Anything you want to add before we sign it off? It's okay to have players that you can't quit, and if they burn you, they burn you. Like. Part part of the guys that you can't quit is just the vibes. That's honestly what it is. Like, <laughs> look, it's cool to draft old man Keaton Allen. It's cool to draft old man Tyler Lockett. It's cool to draft young and spry Chris Olave and Jahan Dotson. We just can't can't quit them. Can't get can't give you a reason to not take them in drafts this year. Yeah, and whoever those players are for you too, just know it's okay. You can be seen uh, in your. <laughs> In your love for Ezekiel Elliott, like I still somehow have. Uh, look, if you want your copy of our draft guide where you can see our full statted out season long projections for these players and 250 more as well, fellasdraftguide.com. That link is down in the description of the video or audio podcast you are listening to. $10 over there, or you can sign up for Underdog Fantasy with the code FELLAS. Make a first time deposit of at least uh, I can't remember what their minimum is over there, but uh, but make a make a first time deposit over there. It's it's no more than ten dollars. I'll tell you that. Uh, and you can join any of their contests as well. You can join our drafts over there. We have three dollar drafts going every single day. Uh, they also have best ball mania running every single day. Plenty of drafts for you to join over there. They will uh, give you a welcome bonus of up to two hundred and fifty dollars and a free pick em square for their pick em lobby as well you can follow us on the socials ff fellas on twitter the ff fellas on instagram fantasy football fellas facebook youtube and tiktok i don't know why i was speaking so fast there uh, i am at lucas wenzel on twitter tyler underscore plath for tyler we will be back later this week uh what do we got a little trending or ending this upcoming oh. week for the 2024 nfl season we'll talk through a handful of guys and whether we think they will continue trending upwards going into this year or uh, if it was just a nice little one-time hit wonder last year uh, and they will be ending going into this season until then stay safe stay healthy make sure you're sub turn on those notifications so you get all of our newest content and deuces deuces